convolutional neural networks make it possible for machines to visualize the world like humans and thus have become an important concept to learn while working with computer vision. These convolutional neural networks excel at classifying image data. Understanding the importance of this, we have come up with this tutorial on convolutional neural networks. Now, before we head on to the session, I'd like to inform you guys that we have launched a completely free platform called as Great Learning Academy, where you have access to free courses such as AI, cloud, and digital marketing. You can check out the details in the description below. Now, let's have a glance at the agenda. We'll start off with a simple case study on neural networks, then we'll have an introduction to image processing. After that, we'll understand the concept of data augmentation. And finally, we'll have a demo using CNNs. The neural network that you will see now might feel little high because we are talking about uh, CNNs over here, convolution neural networks, but more or less the concept remains same. So uh, majorly uh, there are multiple, uh, I would say, you will get multiple sightings on what exactly is leaky relu and where and all you, you need to use them. Uh, just try to understand this concept in mind. Um, Sometimes what happens is, let us say this is your ReLU, okay? So usually ReLU goes like this, all right? Sometimes what happens is that the network that you are having is highly linear network. So usually ReLU is used when there is a non-linear data or when you want to push it, your networks to a non-linear part of it, all right? So when the linearity of the data because usually we don't go ahead and do the linear checks and all those things before implementing, right? So if in case you feel that your model is, even after using ReLU, say your model is not performing that great, okay? In those cases, you can try using leaky ReLU. Leaky ReLU, what it will do is it will try to, uh, you know, clip the gradients after certain points. So, or else even if you talk about the slopes that we are having. It will try to control the slopes such a way that it does not go beyond certain values. All right. So that is where you can use leaky relay. So if you take an example here, what I have done is I'm using a convolution layer. I'm using a convolution layer. And in that convolution layer, I'm using, say, linearity as my activation function. But just to keep a non-linearity in my model, I'm having a leaky relu with a cutoff value of, I'll, I'll say, uh, uh, what do you say, a slope value of around 10%. Around. Yeah, so this is what it is. So usually we use it on uh, on the convolution side, you know, when you want to build a good uh, convolution network on image processing and all that. All right. Uh, if you want detailed uh, uh, notes onto this, I will try to search the official documentation and share it with all of you. All right. There are so many uh, different versions of, uh, or I'll say alterations of these uh, models available. Okay. So this is one example where instead of using direct ReLU, I'm using a leaky ReLU. Okay. All right. So, um, okay. So I think um, we'll do one thing in the third week where we will babysit the neural network. Babysit in the sense, we'll do featureizations and all those. We'll try to use leaky ReLU also. In, in, in place of ReLU and we will see how it affects your output and how the performance goes. So today uh, I will show you two different case studies of um, uh, classification models. So whatever we did, did in machine learning, we can replicate the same thing in terms of uh, say neural networks. And then what we'll do is we'll try to discuss on a possible regressor. Yeah. So it's a part of third week anyway, but no issue since we'll have, we have some time. Let's do that also. Yeah. So the first case study that we have is uh, let me get the data set. Okay. This is the financial case study that we have. And uh, what does it mean is if these are the attributes of a customer, say each row is a customer and there are some attributes attached to it. So again, I leave this on to you guys how you want to do feature analysis, correlation, and all that. That's not a scope as of now, but yes, definitely before starting up with a data set, you can do whatever you people did in that feature engineering. Nothing wrong under that. Yeah. So finally, what do we have is we have got a target column, which we call it exit. 
So whether the customer is moved out or he is still with us, that's what we are supposed to classify. So what about what if you get this uh, under your classification problem and what if you put a neural network on that? Let's see how we do that. So before coming to that, some important libraries. So we have Keras, a sequential model. We have to, if you're talking about keras.layers, then we have to talk about densification. That means every time you add a layer, you have to define it using dense. Think apart from that, more or less everything is same. And the most important one, not to forget here is hot encoder. Now, what exactly you mean by hot encoding, we'll see down the line. And why it is important, we'll see down the line. So these are the libraries that we have. Uh, moving on. What do we have under data set? The shape and size is basically this. So we have around uh, uh, 10,000 cross 14 and the size of the data is around 14K. So it's a minimal, I would say medium sized data set. Uh, looking at the data cleaning part. So I think this is an all we are pretty obvious for it. So we will remove certain columns from that and remaining will store it under a name of DS for example. Next is for your target imbalance. Yes, there is a target imbalance issue. And if needed, you can solve it else. This is a neural network. I don't think so. This will create a much of issue here. Okay, fine. Next thing that we see over here is we have got under geography. So there is a column called geography. Under geography, we have got three options here, France, Spain, and Germany, for example. So if I do an hot encoding onto that, what's going to happen? Germany is going to get, uh, sorry, uh, France is going to get zero, Germany is going to get one, and Spain is going to get two. Yeah, so by default, uh, uh, one. So just to showcase how, how close the readings are, uh, the readings are like these two are almost similar, this is double of them, all right? Good, next is, uh, let's try to define X and Y. So this is my uh, independent data, this is my dependent data, and, um, Post that, what I'm doing is I'm trying to convert all of my uh, categorical data into some kind of numbers using my label encoder, to be very frank, very simple. Yeah. So you might feel a little weird. What I will do is when I deliver this code to you, know, I'll make it more simpler. I will remove all the extra things, which is pretty confusing here. All right. So basically, it is nothing but converting your categories to some kind of numbers, zeros and ones. So if you observe here, as we predicted, France, Spain, and Germany, we got this numbers. And there was one more column called male, female. Yes, as per the alphabetical order, we got zeros and ones. All right? OK, good. So now, uh, I think this is not needed. This is unwanted confusion. So what we are doing now is we are doing a test and train split. So I say 70, 20, 80, 20 split I'm taking, some random state I'm taking. After that. Uh, we say we are performing some kind of scaling function since the data is little up and down. For example, I have done some scalar. Now, there is one more thing available within a neural network, which we call it as normalization or batch normalization. That is almost similar to this. We do it after every layer. Now that comes under week three contents and hence I have not shown the same thing here. Otherwise you would have used that concept also. Okay, so in week three, I will show you how exactly you can do normalization under each layer as, as a default parameter after each layer. Okay, so this is what we are doing scaling on our training and testing data. Post that, if you look at the split, 8000 is to uh, 2000 is our shape. All right, so next thing uh, we are talking about is our model. So the first thing that we are supposed to get in as uh, it's a sequential model, perfect. Next thing is we're talking about the input dimension. So to, to check the dimensions, all you need to do is, you need to go back and check the total number of layer variables that you have. In our case, we have around 11. So we have defined that there should be 11 inputs in our network, okay? Input is total 11. So the first network that you see, or the first neural neurons that you see, they are 11 in number, yeah? And uh, next thing is, it six of them are going so that means 11 of them are connected to six of them in the next layer that's what it means all right and the default activation function we are using here is relu good so this is your layer number one so i will again say this is not the only way to define a layer but yes to get started this is the easiest way to define a neural network and why have i done it in different cells so that you get 
comfortable. And once you're comfortable, we'll push everything into one particular cell. So that's easy. Next thing is, uh, as I said, there are um, six units of uh, layer. So what are we having now? That 11 of them are connected to six of them. All right. Okay, give me a minute. Um, okay, there is an issue here. Okay, one minute, guys. Okay, and actually, this should be in sync. If I have defined six here, I have to define six again here. Otherwise, it will be a mismatch. So, I, as I say, if I am giving output as six, there should be six number of neurons present in my next layer also. Yeah, so, I think there was an issue here. Next is your activation function. I am using sigmoid. Now, you may ask, fine, why did I change it? Uh, probably, we can say post relu the data would have become a very positive data. So in just in case to clip them between zero and one, you can use sigmoid or else the complete network could be defined on rail. So if you ask me what is the optimal way to do it, I will say there is no optimal way. All you, you need to do is mix match, all else depend on your data set also. So whatever inputs you're having, just observe them and try to use. 99% of the times ReLU will work. Certain cases where you have extreme negatives and positives, in those cases, sigmoid will work. Now, why did I take sigmoid? If you remember, at the starting of the code, we did standard scaling here. So in, as soon as I scale my data, definitely we are going to have positives and negatives together. So in that case, you could have started with sigmoid and then ended up with ReLU also, not a problem. All you need to do is mix match and check the accuracy. That's it. Okay, next thing is we have to identify the last layer. So if you observe, if somebody can pinpoint, the first layer is having 11 neurons. That means we are having 11 neurons like this. The second layer, the hidden layer is having only six of them. And the third one should have how much? If somebody can point out this. How many classes we have? Zero and one, yeah. right? So you have two options here. Either I say I will have two layers here or two neurons here, I'm sorry. One of them is representing zero, another one is representing one. In this case, I will choose the activation function as softmax, if this is the case. But what if I don't want this way? There is an alternate way to do it. Just define one neuron. If this is active, if this is activated, it is one. If it is not activated, it is zero. Even you can take that. So if, you, if that is the case, you don't need a softmax because there is only one there is no class over here. So in that case, you go ahead with a sigmoid function. So in this case, just to give you an example, I've taken the output layer as sigmoid. I've defined one neuron as an output, sigmoidal function, and the kernel. Okay, what do you mean by kernel initializer? Kernel initializer is nothing but the way we put random weights. So I'm saying we don't care about it, whatever weights you put in back propagation, we will learn it. There are certain other methods using which you can even define your weights. We will see in next uh, week videos how to optimize these weights also. For now, even if you don't define this, by default, it's going to take uniform itself. All right. So when I give this code to you guys, what you guys need to do is just something from your side is you change this to two and put here softmax and then try to reevaluate the model. Just look at the difference of accuracies that you would get. All right. Any issues with the model creation? It's a very simple three-liner model. One, two, and three. That's it. Not a complex model at all. But why would you use softmax? Softmax, I think you use only when you have multiple um, uh, classifiers, right? Here, I think there's only one classifier. Yes. So just to give you a variety, that if you have two of them, if you don't want to use softmax, you can use sigmoid also. And later on, whatever, because this is a regressed output. Do you people agree with that? This is a regression. Yeah, so you can take the regressed output and then put a manual filter outside this. So if you see here, I have put a manual filter here. Uh, this is our manual filter. I'm saying if my Y pred is greater than 50%, I call it one or else I call it zero. So false means he will not quit. True means he will quit. Just, just a variety, just an option I'm showing you. Yes, definitely softmax is a default one. You could use it. Okay, now one clarification with the input time. We have given input time as 11, right? Yeah. But say like when we do the encoding, like uh, the male and female becomes 0 and 1 uh, and the countries also become 0, 1 or 2, right? Then there will be a correlation, right? We might, need, we might need to drop some columns, right? 
So, is it best to have eleven or less than eleven? No, no, no. Uh, I don't think so. Correlation will affect much over here. To be very frank, because here we are not building any kind of relation between the variables. All, all the, all what we are doing is there is some randomized weights we will throw, and okay. we will multiply those randomized weights with our inputs. We keep doing this and we keep correcting these weights till we say that whatever we are giving in the target column is matching with our output or not. Okay. If you remember our older machine learning techniques, SVM or KNN or decision tree, there were some relationships that we defined there. Here, there is no relationship at all. It is okay. only multiplication and corrections. That's it. Okay. But still, it's a very good method. If you people want to follow that, it's a very good method. Always the data that goes in no, should have least amount of multicollinearity. I agree with that. But in our neural networks, it will not get affected. So you don't have to worry much about the data cleaning part of it here. So, uh, okay. In the neural network, would we get benefit if the data, get, uh, data set is uh, correlated? Would it be an advantage? Um, okay, that's difficult to answer in one way, but um, I, I have never thought this way, but yes, I, as per me, there should not be any problem, even if it is highly correlated also should not be a problem, to be very frank. So I will not say as a benefit, but yes, it will be a neutral kind of stuff. No, no, no good, no bad, something like that. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So this is one type of neural network. I'll say it's a very simple one. So this is very simplistic. So we'll not do this just for as a first, you know, code we are just starting up with. This is what we can define. Now coming on to, so this is your uh, neural network uh, uh, architecture. Now it's still empty. It's not, it's not filled yet. So to fill it up or to first of all, define a back propagation, what we do is we define optimizers. Please remember that. And we have different type of optimizers. We have got stochastic gradient descent. We have got Adam. We have got RMS prop. So every session I'll keep showing you one by one. So last session we, we saw Adam. This session we, we are seeing SGD, stochastic gradient descent. Now, if you ask me what is the difference, the way uh, the algorithm deals with do L by do of weights, the manner in which this is dealt is different in Adam. It different in, it's different in SGD. It's all about how the gradient descent is achieved. All right. So that makes these things different. So this is SGD for now. The most common ones are SGD and Adam. And out of those two, if you ask me, Adam is right now a universal one. It works for anything. All right. Next thing is you're asking me for a loss. Now there are various type of loss available with us. One of them is called uh, say mean sum of errors. Uh, another one could be a difference. Another one could be an entropy. Third one could be cross entropy. Fourth one, if you have high level of categories, let, let us say you have got 10 categories in output. In that case, you can say categorical cross entropy. Yeah. So we will see down the line one by one. So if you remember in my last session, we use categorical cross entropy. In this session, let us say I'm using mean uh, sum of errors. Now, why, why did I choose this? Please remember the output function that we have defined is nothing but a regressor. If you, if you see this output function. So in that case, we don't need it. There is no category involved here. But if in case I would have defined here, say softmax, I would change this to categorical as simple as that. All right. Good. Next thing is what you are focusing on to your model is focusing on to I say fine. I'm okay with accuracy. If you want precision or if you want recall or if you want F1 score, whatever, usually we go ahead with accuracy itself because that is what we learn about so this is what is our uh, back propagation and we compile it so that it gets attached with your model and after that it's always good to check your uh, model so if you look at this this is one model so our current model the first layer uh, has got 11 inputs but it has got six outputs so if you say 11 6 are 66 plus six weights are going from one layer to another way. So if you add this up, you are going to get 72 as a number. All right. So this is how you can compute uh, the parameters. It is not mandatory to do it. Now, why do I say parameters? Why did I show you this calculation is tomorrow? 
if you guys are giving an estimation you know for uh, so this is from management perspective if you're giving an estimation saying that what could be a possible cost of training this network we call these things as a cost why each one is a trainable parameter please remember that look at this now if you want to train a parameter you there is a cost involved onto that so these architectures don't take much time but the code that i showed you earlier if you remember i showed you a code on cnn convolution neural networks these architectures takes hours of your hardware time they're also high end hardware we call it gpus yeah so these things are around uh, 30 to 60 gbs of rams and all this so in that case uh, if you are on a shared basis or if the client also does not want to grant you many GPUs, in those cases, we have to give an estimation. So in those times, this might be, this information might be useful to you. Else, it's of no use. All you need to know is there's a ready-made thing called trainable parameters. From here itself, you can pick up the data. All right. So in this case, I will say it's a very small model. So it should not take much time to get it trained. All right, so now I've given some examples of optimizers and uh, we have RMS prop, usually we use it in computer vision and all down the line. So it's of so no use right now. For regressors and classifiers, you can focus on Adam and SGD as it is. Uh, guys, one more thing is I just need to you know, clean up this code a little bit because it looks a little confusing sometimes because there's a lot of uh, code. So what I'll do is I'll try to optimize it and push it into one cell along with the comments. So that's easy for you guys. Okay, so many comments are of no use to be very frank. Okay, now moving on, uh, we have defined the model, we have done the back propagation, we have seen the model, how it looks like. Next thing is to check, uh, how do you say, uh, to fit the model basically. So fitting thing, what we do is we define what on what you want to fit it. If possible, if you have a validation data also, just put the validation data. So this is your training data. This is your validating data. Next is coming to number of epochs. Now there are multiple ways in which you can choose these epochs. So let me show you one, one way. Uh, <clears throat> so the first way is old school way. What we do is we start with 10 epochs. So once you start with 10 epochs, just observe the gradient descent or the loss the increase or decrease in loss happening for first 10 values. So if you observe here, there is not much difference. Even the accuracy is not getting changed much. So what does it show is no matter if you do 1000 epochs or 10,000 epochs, it's not going to change much. But if you observe after certain level of epochs, let us say after 200, 300 epochs, it is going above 80% from 79 to 80. And after that, it is a very good gradual increase. So like that, sometimes you have to do it manually. There is no formula onto that. So start with a lower number of epochs and then carry on. Or else, if you don't want to do that way, uh, I have an alternate uh, way of doing it. So if you observe here, what I've done is, I have taken a very simple plot of my training accuracy versus my validation accuracy. So the dots are nothing but my training accuracy. And uh, line is nothing but my validation. Accuracy. One minute, let me get us. Yeah, this is a better curve. So if you look at this, <clears throat> the validation accuracy is increasing up to some point. And after that point or after that epoch, so basically X axis represents epoch. This represents your accuracy. Yeah. So after some point, I can say that, yeah, it's almost horizontal down the line. Whereas the training accuracy keeps increasing. Do you see that, guys? What is this thing called? Can you name this scenario? Are you able to visualize this and name it? It's overfitting, okay. Perfect. So this is an overfit issue. So this particular graphs will not give you an exact idea of how many epochs, but at least they will tell you that for this model, training and validation are in hand to hand till epoch number two. And after that, there is a huge increase. So don't train your model much go back and change your network so that this error comes down you know this 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 thing comes down so what i do now is i go back and change my model so it's okay if you don't get it this is a convolution neural network when i change my model if you observe this this is how it looks like 
after doing some changes. Now, what are the changes? Could be number of layers, could be number of dense layers, uh, activation functions, and there are something called dropouts, normalizations, all those extra things that we will see down the line. But if you observe now, until some point, our testing or validation accuracy is more than training, but after a certain number of minimum epochs, they are kind of hand in hand. So you can easily say that for this network, at least you need to go eight or more than eight epochs. All right, good. Uh, I hope you people get the point. If you don't want to use accuracy, you can use loss also. It's opposite of that. But I feel we are good with visualizing accuracy, so better do this. Uh, one question uh, for the layers uh, in between uh, the hidden layers. Is there any good practice to see visualize how many uh, yes in general uh, hidden layers are needed? Yes, I will not recommend that there is a good practice, but yes, I've got hold of some of the papers. So where they have tried to push some formulas. Now some of the formulas goes like this. Say if you have got 11 dimensions as our uh, input and say three as your soft max output, you add them up. So you'll get 14 and divide it by two. At least that many number of hidden layers you need to have. Some of the papers say like this. But when you apply it on some of other data, so when you just read the paper, it has been applied on certain type of data, it works well. But might not be the case in on our data. Why? Because it's all about putting the weights going back and going front and back. So I will say how to decide this. How do I take this challenge here? The first thing I see is cost. Because if you have more number of hidden layers, say, your training time and cost will increase. Do people agree with that? Because you'll have more parameters. So more yeah. back and front prop you have to do. Or else you can say more epochs you need to do. Yeah. So if you have a classification problem, say the parameters and the output, they are kind of comparable numbers. In those cases, two layers are more than enough in middle. Right. But if in case you had, let us say, 100 inputs and some say 10 outputs, now they are not comparable. So in those cases, what you can do is your 100 input might go to some 200 first layer. Then you start reducing 100. Then you say 50, then you say 25, 25 to 10. So in those cases, yes, you will need more layers. But if you apply our formula here, 100 plus 10 is 110 divided by 2, 55. That means you need to have 55 hidden layers. The computer will die. Probably Jupiter will die doing this front and back propagation if you have 55 layers. So this formula more or less does not work much. So again, I will say try to use this kind of logic. How free you are on the cost side of it, how free you are on the training side of it, you have to do it. But one good thing is more the layers, no? more the parameters, better is your model. Do you people agree with that? Because more epochs you have to do to train your parameters. Yeah, but in that case, uh, uh, we might end up in the overfitting as well. So Correct. Agreed. Okay. Uh, how do we really balance all this out? Agreed. So one of my learners from other batch, uh, when he proposed this, uh, I said, uh, he, he told me, can we use grid search here? I said, fine, you can use grid search, not a problem. In grid search, say, you put some values like this, okay? And you start your grid search. But just imagine the time it is going to take for that grid search to end and show you some best parameters. Yeah? Um, so, some days. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. So... That is an issue with this. So all you need to do is you need to be a little patient onto that. You need to do more and more uh, data sets. So once you get onto a data set, you will have after some point, you'll have a hunch saying that, okay, if this is hundred, let me multiply this by two, then keep dividing it by two or else if this is hundred, let me start with 50 and then keep increasing till hundred and then come back. So once you have this kind of attitude of multiple mix match combinations at the end, definitely you will come back with a network but so far there is no formula definitely which gives you a perfect number of epochs i can give you a reference of some blogs that i have you can refer them for your reference but sometimes they work sometimes they don't work and the hidden layer also is there any formula like what you said that's also a big trial and error uh, um, about yeah. how many hidden layers to have you said 100 plus 10 by 2 or something like that right so mm -hmm. how do you how do we decide it? Is four okay. to six an average uh, okay. hidden layers? Yeah, so let's see that. Let's take an example and let's see. 
So um, uh, let's see example for a hidden layer. Uh, where is it? Yeah. So let us say you have got a data set which has got 20 inputs. All right. And the classification as an output is around, say, five, for example. Yeah. So you need to design a hidden layer in middle such a way that this should be satisfied. So what you do is if you want to go ahead with trial and error method, what you do is you start with since I said the difference between this and this is pretty high. Start with two layers. OK, and usually what we do, we diminish the layers. diminish in the sense if this is 20, I will say my next layer could be, say, for example, 50. That means it has 50 neurons into it. Divide this by two, say 25. And from 25, you shrink it to five. All right, three, four, five. Go and do your epochs and check your accuracy. Now, how to check the accuracies? Check the difference between your first epoch, second epoch, third epoch, fourth epoch, and five epoch. So if the this if the the accuracy is not changing overall, they can say that yes, this is kind of a good model because even after doing front and back propagation multiple times, it's not changing. If the accuracy is say less than 70% in this case, then there is an issue with this. Then what you do is you increase it say to 100, make it 50. The second one, introduce one more layer, which you call it as 25, for example. Or else if you want one more 25 layer, you can have one more 25 layer here. Nothing wrong in that. So it's all about, you know, trial and error like this. Most of the times by first three layers itself, you will get it. If you have chosen the optimizers and all perfectly, there should not be a problem. Sometimes we get onto this kind of trouble at just that those points we need to get into trial errors like this. All right. But how, how do, why do you go to 150 or 100 in the first uh, hidden lay? Random numbers, Ramesh, to be very frank. And, and that should be a lot higher than uh, your input yes. variables, right? Yes, so. favorable, yes. Okay. You know why? Because if you observe, mm -hmm. if, you, if, you, if you look at our fully connected neural network, what does it, how the diagram looks like is each neuron, input neuron, okay? Say there are two of them, okay, just to save some time and space, and there are three of them here. What is going to happen is this fellow is connected to this, this fellow is connected to this, and this fellow is connected to all three of them. Also, this guy is connected to all three of them. Now, what happens is if we take the same number of epochs, what will happen is sometimes some of these, let us say this is zero and this is one. So in this case, what's going to happen, the input that is going to go will be always zero. Agreed? So if you have same number, let us say you had two of two. So what's going to happen if you have something like this, there are chances that if both of them are zero, we are going to end up with zero. And if this is zero, the further propagation also will be zero. So it's always good to have some extra values. There could be by chance, there could be one more, which could come and spark them up. Right? Okay. It can be a possible theory behind it. But again, I will not okay. say it's the optimal way to do it. You can have 20 inputs, you can have your first layer as 20 also, nothing wrong into that. All you need okay. to check is your epochs, how they are behaving. So don't directly go with 100 epochs and wait. For the first time when you run the neural network, go ahead with 10 epochs. Or else uh, go with 20 epochs, do this plot, this kind of plots. I'll, 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 I'll add this code into our current thing. Do this kind of plots, you'll come to know, should I go more or not? And this is going to be overfit or not. You can predict it immediately. After that, go back and change your layers. <clears throat> so there are certain companies now who are working on this concept called auto DL. So <laughs> that bot is kind of working on how to predict, optimize values for us. Once that is out, I think we could have some, some relief on to predicting uh, the numbers. Yeah. My suggestion is if you are building a neural network, make it a little complex. Complex in the sense, have more hidden layers so that the chances of failing will be very less. Yeah. If you have more parameters. Also, chances of overfitting also will be very high. <laughs> so both the risks are there. But yes, I think once you design two or three of them, you will you'll get a hold of it. All right. Now, 
since we have given this as a regressor, what did we get is we got these things as an output. Now, all I need to do is I need to have a soft uh, uh, artificial uh, filter over that. So what we have done is we are saying if your predicted value is greater than certain threshold value, it should be true, else it should be false, just to predict zeros and ones, that's it. All right. So please remember, if you have a classifier, output should be softmax. If you want to make the same thing as a regressor, use anything except softmax, it will work good. So now if you take this particular case study and you can go back to our linear regression data set or you can go back to any of the regressor data set that we have done and just go back and try to compare your deep learning with your linear regression. If you remember, we had done some codes under linear and logistic regression. Yeah, so use the same data set to practice. All right. And then once you guys are comfortable building these layers, I will give you some more complex data sets. Complex in the sense they have got more variables. All right. Good. So this is it. And uh, uh, actually, one question on softmax side. Actually, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the softmax whose activation function has been designed just for the final layer in this case. Uh, if uh, yes. def by definition it goes up. Yes. Yes. So, Probably just a wild question. Why it uh, went up like this? Why couldn't the existing functions could handle this? Okay. See, if I have to use our existing functions, then you have to design a filter like this. Did you see that? We designed one small filter here. Mm -hmm. yeah. so we have to exclusively put a filter outside the neural network to do the processing. What if I can use an activation function itself to filter it out? Yeah. So it's just an additional facility given to us, which we have, you know, hyped it up. And now we are completely dependent on softmax. Whenever you have a category default softmax. Okay. Yeah. So even if you look at my, our, uh, this is an industry convolution code. Yeah. We are doing some image processing here. If you look at the output, the output by default softmax and it works pretty good. So we don't, we have no way of choosing any other, uh, what do you say? Uh, activation here all right so guys whatever you have seen now right as a fully connected neural network down the line it will be converted like this it's a convolution neural network okay so I will not say again that this is it this is the ultimate deep learning after doing convolution and if you come back you will feel like it's very simple so these all are basics so that you guys could do this can do this all right very less people now in industry use, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, deep learning for regression and classification. Anyway, our machine learning algorithms are doing good on that. So let's not spend our cost and hardware onto that. The real reason why we are doing or learning deep learning is so that I, we can train you guys onto computer vision and NLP, to be very frank. So this is a computer vision topic, all right? Okay, let me not uh, confuse you guys in that way but this is it more or less okay so uh, please pick up some of the older data sets and try to use um, neural nets onto that all right so this was one example from our current scope this is the maximum we can go let me show you one more case study <clears throat> uh, great learning Neural network week number two. Yeah, in this we will use I think uh, softmax so that you get a difference between both of them. So what do we have today is, say we have got a data set. Uh, so we'll not use. See guys, one more thing, please remember, some of our codes from now will have a reference to Google Collab. That means they are asking you guys to go and run Collab. If you want to kickstart, do let me know. I will show you what is this. Majorly, you will need collab from your next module, not now. So some of our codes might have a reference to collab. So you can ignore that line and comment it. Otherwise, it's going to give you an error. And never ever try connecting drive, uh, sorry, collab with uh, Jupyter. All right. It is going to end up in a big mess. And just to caution you guys, I've already formatted my machine twice because of that. So either you use collab or you use Jupyter, one of them. All right, so these are the codes for connecting it with Collapse, so we'll not focus on that. Now, what do we have today is, we have got some, some data. 
let us say some parameters okay around 28 parameters if i'm not wrong and each parameter says that whether uh, there is a fraud detected or fraud is not detected something like that so if this was not there it was a regression problem but since we have given a class we have got some kind of uh, what is a uh, target variable from class over here all right so the data processing goes a similar way i will try to neat this code up this is a little older code i'll try to make it little you know neat and more presentable so all you need to know here is now is this is what is my test and train data so this is my training data this is the total number of columns that i have and this is my target data this is the total number of targets i have now looking at this can somebody tell me what should be my first layer pretty simple obvious should be real. yeah correct uh, i'm talking about the total number of neurons so if i want to uh, develop a neural net out of this yeah, 20, 29 perfect perfect so just that's the reason we showcase this so once you guys are comfortable after that you you don't need not to do the sprinting thing it's really primitive so now if you come to the layer part of it if you observe i am having 29 inputs given to my first layer these 29 inputs are connected to 64 of them from the next layer so why do we write 64 here so that there are 64 different weights which are ready to be pushed on to the next layer that is what we mean by this all right next thing is activation function by default i use relu here same next layer also i'm using relu you might find these two new terms i will explain you after this code what are they this is a topic from week number three we will see what are these things for now this is my input layer this is my hidden layer and the output layer that i'm having is an activation function sorry is a softmax layer as an activation why do I have two? Because I have zeros and ones as an output. So either you use my last logic or you use this logic, whatever. It's good. So that's why I've given an option here. Either you use, if you use it as one, it's a regressor. If you use it as two, it's a classifier. That's it. So it's a very simple network. All right, straightforward. Now moving on, if you look at this, next thing is I have defined my optimizer. So by default, it should be Adam and also it should be added here so now what i'm doing is i have i am showing one of the hyper parameters which is available inside our optimizer where you can choose the learning rate yeah so the uh, learning rate that we have chosen is very low here 0 0.001 for adam say and the same variable i'm initializing here in my compilation model dot compile so now i'm saying compile what compile an optimizer which is an adam or else if you don't want to do that you can do this also if you just put a quote around it it will mean the same thing then you don't have to define this basically all right so both the options are available next is what is your loss so in this case i'm saying it's a binary data why because it's zeros and ones only two of them so it's a binary data and it's a cross entropy if say it was zero one two three then i will say categorical underscore cross entropy because it's a highly categorical data and the matrix that we are using is nothing but your accuracy matrix that's it usually this uh, optimizer does not change it remains almost similar right next if you look at the summary of the model this is how it looks like there are 2113 trainable parameters and there are 128 non trainable parameters any idea what are these why do we have a non-trainable parameter here? The means, the arithmetic parameters. Basically. Okay. Arith arithmetic parameters in the sense, if you are kind of near to that, if you can elaborate yeah. a little. The means, medians and all. Um, okay, all right. Mm -hmm. I think the input is coming twice, 64 into 2, 128. You cannot train, is that? something related to that Krishna okay could be could be possible else you just take a logic like this uh, okay one more thing is this is an older code just give me a moment guys I think this is not rerun let's 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 try to rerun and generate the latest one I'm sorry uh, uh, 
All right, and it is a little slow, okay? So whenever you're working on this, this stuff, it might become a little slow. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll start from here. What went wrong here? Activation function is softmax, uh, unknown activation function softmax, yes, because it should be small. All right, so the model is defined, then we'll get the optimizers. Okay, now let's go and check it again. See, it changed up. Now you see non trainable parameters are zero. So usually in a simple neural network, all of them what you give as an input is a trainable parameter all right that's the reason i i spotted an issue here now when you come to something like a concept of convolution neural networks and transferred learning and all you might find a split between trainable and non-trainable parameter there are chances but usually in a simple neural network please remember this should be zero if not please go and recheck your model also there is one caution to all of you is if you observe here, these are our dense layers, okay? And you, you might observe it is showing me four, five, six, whereas we have just three over here. You know, why is that? Because this model was already run earlier and on the top of that, I'm rerunning it. That means the model is seeing that I am adding one more dense layer. It's not a, what do you say, adaptable model. It's a synchronous model. So if you keep repeating this thing you know, again and again, you will see a lot of extra dense layers over here, which is not a part of your network originally. All right. So in that, that case, what you need to do is you need to kill the kernel and reload it back. So that will start fresh from dense layer number one. I hope you get it. All right. So please be careful with that. Don't keep reiterating and rerunning it. It's going to unwantedly populate your network like this. Finally, when you fit it, what happened? I have two, but you have given an array shape as one. Okay, that is weird. Let's go and check. Okay, we have not done what hot encoding here. That is the issue. We have not done hot encoding. Okay, just give me a minute. We'll do that also. Very old uh, data set. I don't want to show that much but yes let's 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 do a hot encoding here where is my hot encoder data processing training yeah here it is so guys remember one thing is we need to convert whatever we have in in as a categorical data always so let me rerun it we will try to redo it Shape, X data head, Y data, Y data shape. Okay, so here we'll run this, not a problem. Pre-processing, normalize this. Yeah, after this step, we will say we will do hot encoding. Now, what do you mean by hot encoding? Even though it is in the form of zero and one, but if you observe as per neural network, what will be the output of neural networks? It will be something like this always, right? Right? So the output will look like this. It will be a matrix like this. So, but if you observe here, we are having a single digit. So what it is saying is neural network is expecting two outputs as an output layer, but you are giving us only one of them. That's the reason it is throwing us an output. So what we'll do now is we'll do a hot encoder onto that. So uh, let's try to say this is nothing but your Y train. All right, and on the top of Y train, we will say or then go to my Y train itself. And the same thing we'll do it for Y test also. Yeah. But let's see now. Ah, okay, I need to define the two categorical also. Just give me a minute. It's a Keras uh, 
Where is my two category? Yes. Do, do, do. Good. So now if you observe, this has changed to two. Perfect. Now it should work. Yeah, you see the model has started up and uh, it will not take much time. These uh, no, smaller layers are pretty simple. So we have given around 700 epochs. And if you observe the accuracy, what we are getting is near to uh, uh, validation. All right. Okay. So now just to check what we'll do is just to print the validation accuracy also. Let's try to incorporate the validation data here so that we don't have to redo anything and we will get to know whether it's a overfit or underfit model. All right, I just need to check if this is correct. Yeah, let's redo this. So, if you observe, the accuracy that I got for training is 99, and the same thing for validation is also 99. All right, so it's a very good model. You don't have to go ahead and add any more layers in the middle. This is working pretty fine as a uh, classifier. All right. Good. So number of epochs is 10 and uh, that's what I think we have got it. So at the end of 10 epochs, we are happy with it. It's perfectly fit model. All right. Uh, second way of uh, checking is you can, you can re you can run the evaluator part of it. So if you, if you see here, what I did was I added our evaluation here itself. If you don't want to do that, there is another method where you just call back the testing data and call your model and evaluate your model on the testing data. You will get the accuracy here. I say this is better version so that you can track epoch to epoch. What is the trend basically? All right. So this is a little old school. You can remove it if you want it. And finally, if you want to print the confusion matrix, this is how we do it again. This is your old school type. We don't have to much focus now on confusion matrix. No, it's not going to help us much. All right. So this is more or less a very simple classifier you can build like this. I hope everybody got the point of doing this. Yeah, in last code, we had a regressor. So it was not asking us for a output two. In this case, it is not a regressor. So it is explicitly telling me you have to define this as two. Otherwise, the network is going to fail. Why? It is expecting two at an output. Why? Because we have written two here. That's the reason we have to do one hot encoding. So please remember, don't forget this step. It, 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 was, it was like, if you remember for unsupervised learning, uh, normalization was must like that. If you're doing classification, this is must. Good. Any questions onto this? Simple, pretty straightforward. Ashish, Ganesh, Hema, Jyoti, Mohit, Nitesh, Ramesh. Are we good? Yep. Yes, uh, yes, yes. So just just one thing, basic question. What is convolution network? You've said it so many times and I've also read something out, but I don't think we've covered that. So what, what is what is that if you can just explain yeah. it? Let me way. let me spell it out for you guys. Now, say you have an image. All right. This image is one megapixel image, for example. All right. Now, if you want to put this into a neural network, let us say this is your neural network all right can somebody tell me how many inputs do i need here if i want to put this image let us say this image has a cat inside it all right and i want to classify that there is a cat here i want to identify if you people see on linkedin and youtube you will be seeing people are putting a square around an object and showing okay we have done some kind of computer vision or object detection you know so if I want to do that, and if my size of my image is one megapixel, what should be my size of inputs given to a fully connected neural network? Can somebody do the one megapixel, one megapixel. Perfect. That means I need to have a network which should have one mega neurons as an input. If one mega neuron is my input, what will be my hidden layers? <laughs> can I say, I can say two mega? Then we'll reduce to one mega, then half a mega, then 25% of mega like that. And then we'll get an output of it, correct? So we just saw in a simple neural network, which we designed, there were around 3000 parameters to be learned. 
Now imagine we are having one mega parameter just as input and remaining we don't even consider. How many parameters we have to learn, guys? What's going to happen here? Each epoch will take hours and hours to go front and back. Agreed? Yes or no? Yep. So right. what's going to happen? Either you need a very powerful system for that, hardware for that, or else you cannot do this. So what we do is we bring in a concept of convolution. Now what exactly is CNN? This is one of the most challenging part of your course here. <laughs> All right. What is CNN is? CNN, so let us say, for example, this is one face that we have there in the image, for example. And our job is to detect this face. What CNN does is CNN has, instead of having weights, if you people remember, in, in neural networks right now, we are talking about randomized weights. Instead of randomized weights, we have randomized filters. This filters, what happens is they go and get multiplied with these numbers. It's nothing but a matrix. You people are able to visualize. The image is nothing but a matrix consisting of some numbers. Each number is nothing but a pixel, colored pixel. It goes and gets multiplied. And from now on, I will use this as an input to my fully connected neural network. So look at the size of this. Let us say this is a three cross three filter. So now I will input this to my neural network. I will input all of these feature maps till I find out one particular feature map which covers the whole image. More or less, this is what is CNN. I'm, I'm reducing the size of my computation so that I could use fully connected neural network to do my image process. Yeah. Um, Ramesh, fine. I think you asked the question, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, it is so, very so, complex. It is uh -huh. very, very complex. It is going to be one of the heaviest portions that you guys are going to see. But it's really interesting. Why? Because the art uh -huh. over here is to reduce the image to a very short size and then take that thing for image process rather than wasting time and taking each one of them to image process. So Krishna, okay, why okay. do we, Krishna, why do we always use three by three uh, detector, feature detector, uh, Krishna? Yes. Uh, so there is a formula. Basically, the formula says width of the image minus width of the filter plus twice of padding divided by uh, stride. This is the formula. So for others, I'm really sorry. Don't want to confuse you. But okay. if I want to define an output size, that means the size which I have to give here is a fully connected neural network. I need to have to decide some size of my filter. So when you have decided this, what you do is you keep, take this, this side and take your F other side. And finally, whatever answer you get, that will be your filter size. As I said, usually, okay. usually what we do is we use ReLU. Why we use ReLU? Because it, it gels in with almost all of the numbers. Similar to that, 3 cross 3, 4 cross 4, and 2 cross 2. These are the common numbers which will go and gel up with almost all of the data. See, instead of 3 cross 3, if I say 30 cross 30, what's going to happen? I am going to take a very big feature. Again, I am going to go and populate my fully connected neural. The whole purpose here is to take smaller chunks to identify. That's it. Okay. All right. So okay. for example, for, for, for people who are new to this, just take an example. What if I show you something like this? Say, I don't show you the whole image. I just show you this. Can somebody predict what exactly this could be if I complete it? A. A or... Can star I say a fish? Could be a fish. Star. Could be a star. star. So you don't need the whole image to be predicted. A certain chunk of an image can be taken, and immediate prediction will be thrown out, saying that it is. For example, uh, recently I have done this. Let us say there is a dog. Let us. Say. So what we do is, when convolution runs onto the ears of the dogs, there are very few dogs who have exactly flat ears. For example, it could be. Doberman, it could be uh, Husky, it could be say uh, German Chef. So we already have learned it. So what if I can just identify the whole dog rather than scanning the whole dog, just scan certain part of it and identify it. We save a lot of computation time over. All right. This is what is CNN. Now there are but hybrids of that. 
So let's. But, <laughs> but Krishna, sorry, uh, I, I think I'm deviating from the topic. But the, without the whole image, how would how would we know whether that's an ear of a dog or ear of a rabbit? We need to some of the convolution network has to see the whole image, right? Yes. After going through the feature map, yeah. it yeah. does. It does, Ramesh. It, it does. Okay. It does. My only point over here is rather than taking the whole image and throwing inside the fully connected neural network, what I do is I take some chunks out of it. Oh, okay, 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 got it. Then okay. we will pass each one through fully connected. So the computation time will be faster. Okay, okay. Yes. All right. <clears throat> yes. So this is, was your CNN. All right. Good. So this is what is your neural network. I'll introduce you guys to this image processing, not completely. I don't want to burden you guys right away, but we'll take one example and we'll try to build some neural network and do some featureization using that. All right. So let's talk about the very first topic. Now, this is a big challenge in our industry currently. Now, why do I say that? Very simple example. Um, have you guys heard about NLP? I think yes, I have shown you some implementations. Yes. Yes. Also, you guys have heard about computer vision. Right? So what, what basically these topics are is, or we can also call uh, voice processing also now. And uh, what are these topics is, you have got a pre-trained data. That means if you're talking about NLP, you have got, let us say if you're talking about within NLP, you're talking about uh, some kind of uh, sentiment analysis. What customer is talking about? Is he talking positive, negative, good, bad about us? So if you want to huge, if you want to do this kind of processing on in bulk, you can use NLP sentiment analysis here. Now to do this, what you need is you need a very good corpus file, a backend file of it. Yeah. So why do I say we need a good back corpus file is we need to have all the possible combinations here itself so that I can train my neural network. All right. These files are usually very heavy. Um, if I show you guys an example of it, if you look at this, this is a corpus file available with me for flowers. So if you have, if I want to, if you give me an image and if I want to classify that image in one of these flowers, I need these kind of images as a backup to train my model saying that this is a tulip. Okay, for example, or uh, this could be a tulip. So there could be some positive examples, there could be some negative examples we don't know about. So this is the first challenge that we usually face, how to get these kind of corpuses. So if you talk about voice processing, um, I'm not sure, guys, have I shown you anytime anything on to voice ever? No, no, right. So just give yeah, me last a... week you said something and it uh, perfect, it perfect. Typed, right? Yeah, perfect. So that voice processing. Imagine how much level of voices it had to record to understand. So that corpus that we had was from Google. For now, it is free, so we are using it. Google was kind enough to gather certain people from certain ethnicities, certain regions to speak certain type of words so that whenever I speak something, it tries to match my accent and my word with the nearest value and tries to predict that I said that. If you observed last week, whatever I said, not 100% was a match, but yes, majorly it understood what I was trying to say. So the complete challenge for any neural network here lies to gather this kind of combinations so that we can train a network. That is what we call it as augmentation. Okay, you can relate that topic with augmentation. Now, what do I mean by augmentation? Let us say you have given this as an image to your neural network, saying that this is a cat. Now, what if I tilt my image? Or what if I rotate my image? Or what if I crop my image? What if I zoom in my image? Whatever you do with this. If in case, if you train a neural network onto this, only one picture saying this is cat, and if you present this to him, a simple neural network, it will not take it up. Why? Because if you observe the pixels present here, and if you take the same locations in your image, current image, there might be empty space. So obviously it's going, not going to match it up. So it's very important for us to make sure that before we give a data to a neural network, we have done a proper augmentation. Augmentation means we have done these kind of changes. 
now it is in our hand whether we have to do this. So there are certain functions available within neural networks which will allow us to do augmentation. So it will ask us if you want to rotate, if you want to flip, if you want to crop, if you want to zoom, whatever you want to do. It. All right. Sometimes even it allows us to change the colors also. So this is called data augmentation. So if I just present this, it's not a major topic, but yes, uh, it is much talked about because not all of us have a very good access to all these things. All right. So please remember, it says we may not have a big data set to create more data. So how to create a more data? You can create more data using your augmentation technique like this. All right, so just take an example of an augmentation. What we can do is, this is an image which belongs to a dog. If you want to have, what do you say, uh, transform the image, let us say from color, he is transformed into a gray scale. From there, I'm giving it to a CNN. Now in this case, it is easy for us to identify. What if tomorrow the snow and stuff is not there, only this much face is available. We are not sure how comfortable your neural network will be. I think somebody's camera is on, guys. Yeah. How comfortable the neural network will be to identify that it's a husky, right? So in those cases, augmentation will be of a very good help. So this is one case where you can say I need augmentation and definitely in computer vision, you need a good backup of data. Otherwise, neural network is of no use. Okay. Um, what all we can do inside augmentation? So you can do flips, you can do rotations, cropping, scaling, color jitter means changing the uh, U and all those part of it. Uh, other creative techniques could be, uh, if, if we talk about uh, convolution nets, it could be translation, rotation, stretching, sharing, lens distortion. So you can do a lot of things. Now you might be wondering what are these terms? This will come in the first week of computer vision where we will use certain filters on top of an image such a way that we will change the look and feel of the image. So this is something like you can, we can say on um, Instagram, you know, those instant filters are there. Yeah. Some of the filters, you know, they change the background, they blur the background and all. so this is what the filters are. So you just have to define a filter which could be multiplied with an image and you'll get a new image out of it. That's it. So this is what is by lens distortion, sharing. And all. So this is augmentation. Any questions? Pretty straightforward. So in computer vision, we'll see the real application of it. For our neural networks part of it, we usually have a good backup data. It, it should not be a big trouble. All right. Now coming to weights initialization. Now this was a common, I think in the first session, a lot of people asked, do we actually put randomized weights? I will say it, by default, we do it. But if we don't want to do it, there are certain different type of weights available with us. Let's see what are those weights. So uh, one minute, yeah. So this is the total weights that we can say we have it in, in our hands. Either we can use zero initialization. We can put all the weights as zero. Yeah, we can put random, random initialization. That is what we do currently. We have something called Xavier initialization. We have something called HE and there are many more. So if, if you are a researcher in a company and all, if you want to do it, you can even develop your own weights and try it out. Now, in today's case study that I'm going to show you, we will see random versus HE. So first, we will, we will start with HE, we'll implement a model, and then we will change it to random and we'll check how the accuracy changes. All right, so these are the two common ones if you want to use it. Else comes your zero initialization. So any idea what will happen if this is zero? So any idea where I can use zero initialization? Because you remember what is zero initialization? You're directly putting weights as zero. So no matter what your inputs are, your output is going to be zero only. Getting my point? So this is one, uh, yes. this is one little peculiar um, example of weights. So here they have shown what if what happens when W is equal to zero. So the weights are zero. Definitely whatever is your input, let us say all of them are zeros. The same thing we are going to get as an output to be very frank. But if you remember inside this, we were talking about not only your input weight gets multiplied with input gets multiplied by weight, but also it gets added by a biasing factor. You remember that? So sometimes if you want to use a strong biasing factor with, you know, weights as zero, even we can do that. 
but the only issue is the output will be very diminished basically because the complete neural network will be running on biases uh, shoulders basically because the rest everything is zero so if i choose a very good activation function say like tan h or sigmoid where there are chances that anything which is zero or less than zero also has scope to pass plus a biasing factor there could be chances that yes you might get some outputs i will not say it's a very good way to do it but in worst case i don't know in certain situations we don't know if in case you need that even you can go ahead and initialize zero all right but uh, but 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 krishna um, the first the first time would be zero but of course the biasing factor will come into effect but mm -hmm. from the second epoch things mm -hmm. will change right will it not add weight to the yes the 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 things will change from second epoch correct that's why i said the biasing factor will be the ruling uh, ruling thing over here so there are chances sure. that from the second point or third point we might they, we might start changing the weights itself so if you want to start with a very fresh you know you don't want any junk in your network you can do this but it will take some time it will take more epochs to come to some 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 normal number i hope you're getting my point yeah perfect so this is what it is and uh, majorly these are the ones we use it apart from that random and he are the, the common ones so today we'll see both of them okay so i've given some some text onto that uh, if you guys like it i will publish the ppt you can just go through the same thing what we explained and if you want to learn what is he basically is the formula for he Two divided by size of l minus one, and I'll give you the complete details of that. You don't have to get into that detail, majorly because uh, we use always so far in my career. I've never used H E and Xavier to be very frank. Could be used in a very you know tight, constrained uh, environmental condition where you have you don't want the parameters to go certain beyond certain characteristics, uh, values, and all. In that case, you can use these two. Else, random solves majorly the job. Okay, so this was your weights. So we can use any of them. That's what I meant. Overview. Now moving on, coming to the topic of regularization. Now, what do you mean by regularization? In machine learning, do you remember we did something on regularization like standard scaling or clipping if the data goes beyond certain value, like outlier treatment, if you will remember. Something like that could be done here. Why? Say you have a neural network and uh, you have done a randomized weight kind of thing. So when you give an input, say you have given uh, ReLU as an output. So in, in all of these layers, ReLU is an output. So what happens is when your input gets multiplied with certain weights and goes to the next layer, there are chances that you might get a magnified image or magnified signal of your current input. There are chances, depends on our weight, we don't know. Also, when it goes here, there are chances that you might get a magnified version again. Yeah. Anyway, it's going to follow ReLU activation function itself. I agree. But let us say if my, my input was very low and because of weights, it has got magnified. So because of this issue, what we do is we try to introduce one extra layer in middle of all of these. That is what we call batch normalization or I will say standard scalar for a neural network so that whenever an output comes out of a network it has to pass through this gets normalized and then goes to the next one so that we have a check that whatever data we are giving is in bounds it's not going out of our bounds that's it sometimes it is useful sometimes it is not so tomorrow when you're doing a neural network and you are having an issue of overfitting or underfitting those times you can go back do this kind of feature engineering it's not necessary to put for all of them. You can start with one or two, and then if you see a positive result, start putting for all of them. We'll see today in our case study how to do that. All right, so this is called batch normalization. Second concept of regularization is dropout. Dropout means, a quick question to all of you. Now, as I said, there is no formula for neural networks, as we said that. There is no formula for uh, out input uh, hidden less. There is no formula for total number of neurons within him hidden layers. We have not, no clue over it. Do you think all the layers and all the neurons are duly important for driving the output? No. No, right? no, right? So it could be like, we can talk, we can say like that, there are five employees in a company. Three of them are driving the project. Two of them, sometimes they come and help, sometimes they don't. 
so even if their presence and no presence also not going to affect much definitely by removing them the efficiency could come down because the burden on these guys will increase a little bit but only for certain point after that will normalize it same is the case here not all the weights or not all the neurons that we have are equally important so what we do is we bring in a concept of dropout where i if i say dropout is equal to 0.2 that means 20% of the neurons please manually switch them off no matter what it is randomly choose 20% out of them and switch it off yeah this could be used as an accuracy increase or model tuning part of it at the end again if you ask me how 20% i got random value there is no formula for that start with 10% 20% 30% I usually keep myself up to 50%, not more than that. It's not fair from our side to do it, to be very frank. So even you can do dropouts like this, where you can ask the network to switch it off. This is the dropout concept, all right? Now, uh, so, so this is what it looks like. So here on the left-hand side, they have shown a fully connected neural network. Here they have reduced certain uh, neurons out of it and the model gives almost a similar performance to this. So I can say that yes, in this case dropout kind of works. All right, now, okay. So if you look at this, uh, I feel this is a little silly example, but yes, it will create some impact. What it says is what if you have got some features? So this particular neuron classifies that a particular image that we have given has an ear. It has a tail, it is furry, it has claws, it is having mischievous looks. So if you want to predict this as a cat, has, having an ear is not going to make a very big difference to your answer because there are a lot of animals who have that. Having claws makes a difference. I will say about this particular weightage, this should be given more weightage. So there are certain weights and neurons which could be switched off. And even if you do it, you are going to end up with some uh, classification not a uh, error basically so this is just an example to show you guys all right so this is your dropout <laughs> another interpretation of a dropout could be um it is it is it will kind of you know simulate an ensemble model are you people able to get uh, simulate this or, or, or understand what i'm trying to say here Dropout uh, is training a large ensemble model. Do you agree with that? Or no? Uh, um, not able to connect on this point actually. Okay. You remember what is ensemble techniques? I think recently we probably three, four models back you would have done this. What do you mean by ensemble? We have got weak classifiers, which are nothing but your individual algorithms. What we do, we combine them into one platform and then we take, let us say I give an input to all of them. And the input that I've given actually the target column is zero. Let us say the first algorithm classifies it as one, next one is zero, next one is zero, next one is zero. That means I will take the majority out of all three of them and I will say yes, my final answer is zero. So this is called a weak classifier. This is called a strong classifier. Agreed? This is our ensemble technique. So if you remember, we had done random forest, bagging, boosting, all those techniques. Yeah. Same thing, what if I keep, because every time I remember, I said every time when you rerun your model, 20% of randomly chosen values get switched on and switched off. So can I say in worst first cycle, these neurons will be active. Second cycle, it is possible that this neuron could be active and this neuron could be deactivated. You don't know. So sometimes in a possible scale, you can think this as a ensemble technique where you by mixing and matching various uh, neurons, you are creating a final answer. All right, just an analog. You don't have to worry about it. We are not going to implement an uh, ensemble here just to give you a visualization of dropouts. All right, so this is it. So 
so the challenge would be the training how how would the training be every set of training would be on a on on a set dropouts or would it be random within an epoch uh, among the epoch in one training session in one epoch same num- uh, in one epoch one set of uh, neurons will be dropped out in the next epoch there are chances not the same one gets back to it because as i said it's randomly chosen mm-hmm. So okay. dropout is is kind of costly sometimes for us because in one case in the last epoch let us say this was switched off let us say this particular thing was switched off so the weight was not improvised onto this so if I switch it on in the new epoch again I have to retrain his weight that's why I say it's a little costly affair to do this all right so not right. all right. of the times we'll do dropout worst case when the model is not improving at all we'll try to push some dropouts and even sometimes after pushing dropouts also model is not going to increase because of this kind of issue as I say <laughs> just a backup technique available with us that's it. and I, I personally feel it is a waste of hardware <laughs> because if I have if I have said that I need these neurons and if I switch them off I don't know it, it's not fair to be very frank yeah Good. So I think majorly this is what this is what you can do to tune your model. And apart from this, for tuning your model, uh, you can use different type of epochs, different batch size, different activation functions, uh, say different uh, output functions, different uh, optimizers. Whatever we saw today, you can mix match them and change your uh, inputs and outputs. All right. So again, if you kind of do mix match and trying to get it right. Then of course, it just the best form of mix and match is your grid and random set, random exactly. set, exactly. and that's going to be that's very expensive. So, <laughs> so this is more like a brute force <laughs> grid and random. So uh, we'll do one thing, Ramesh. In this case, is I'll introduce you guys to Collabs. I don't know if some of you have already started using it. Collab has got a RAM. Of- so so, so uh, sorry. So last, uh, I mean, we all did uh, Collab in last uh, recommendation oh. engine because the oh. the size was so big that. Uh, yeah. All our machines kind of crashed. So, yeah. so we did last uh, last project. Almost everybody did in Collab. Perfect. So you guys are good at it. So you, if you want to do grid search, no, do it in Collab. At least it will not be so bad as your computer. At least the output will be faster. To be frank. But yes, grid search. Uh, I don't think so. It's a good. Uh, no, actually, even Collab uh, for all of us uh, crashed on, uh, on 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 some of the uh, trainings. Okay. <laughs> because we went out of memory and we got an out of memory error uh, oh. when we had the constraints, uh, a lot of parameters that we were training. Okay, 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 good, fine. So let's see. But uh, from my side, uh, how I deal is I go by gut feeling and mix match. So this is a little time taking, uh, you know, implementation. That's why people sometimes refrain from using AI. You know, that's the only reason. Okay. Good. So I think we have done. So any business problem, any business, pro- so Krishna, any business problem that we use um, deep learning for, or is it primarily uh, picture, video, audio, voice, NLP, you know, that type, or is are there business problems also that we tend to use? I know that the example also said that you can use any regression problem instead of machine learning, you can use deep learning, but any valid uh, business case that uh, you use it for? Yeah, so majorly you use it for uh, systems which are dynamically changing, first of all. Why? Let us say you have got a a customer. For example, I'll give you, uh, we have a customer Airbus, for example. Yeah, so Airbus usually in uh, per minute, per flight, let us say of Airbus, generates around 3 GB of data. For example, I'm not sure about it. Say 3 GB of data is generated per flight, per minutes say not even seconds so what happens you have trained an ml yeah now just imagine if you wait for say one year how much amount of new data your airbus can generate or your company can generate so what's going to happen the data that you are have model you have trained on if you take the difference with the newer data and if you find there's a significant difference onto that what's going to happen this ml that you have designed is no more valid agreed yeah so what you have to do you have to retire it you have to retrain on the new data it is not dynamic 
unless and until you have a system where every day it gets retired it gets retained and deployed back <laughs> if you have a system like that very good perfect so in these kind of case studies you can bring in your neural network because neural network if you just see whatever input you give i will adjust myself and i'll give you an output out of it even this has to be called no doubt but this is much easier than this because if you remember in ml you have to do lot of changes you have to do featureizations tunings uh, correlations lot of things you again you have to check and then you have to go whereas in this we are free from all that issues even we do not even go and check for normality here do you people see that that level of sophistication could be achieved by this so this is one so we don't we don't we don't retrain as the data changes every day is it is that what you say which one your neural net yeah neural nets you don't need to retrain it every day is it is that what uh, is it? Yes. because the data is changing is what you're saying right yes. so because the data so, is changing yeah so data mm -hmm. data helps us to retrain them so we have certain so when we go about so when we cross the basic level of neural network i will show you some more things which will mm -hmm. retrain itself they are called self healing neural networks they will automatically retrain themselves Right, right, right. So that is my next question. Recommendation huh? systems. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. in recommendation systems under collaborative filtering, we had a topic where Amazon maintains your data. Now, how often this data table is adjusted? You people know that. You, you know mm -hmm. when a person, yeah, yeah. if you are doing a user-based collaborative filtering, the person will switch from might be from one group to another group. depending on his choice and current values so if amazon says that i will keep a gap of 15 days you know to sync up my data to refresh my data what's going to happen for a period of 14 days amazon might be sending wrong recommendations to this customer because this customer has already moved out of that group so what does this uh, amazon has to do amazon would have be having a bot which will trigger this let us say every second or every 10 seconds so that whatever recommendations are thrown to a customer are not wasted because see even if you if you get irrelevant recommendations no you lose interest after some point so there is a business behavior problem and also a functional behavior problem because of this same thing we do it over here we have got some triggers which will tell the neural network to retrain itself on the newer data these are called self healing neural network the best example i will give you is uh, um uh, i will say google car for example so when the google car is on the road so that that's a topic of reinforcement learning anyway it's a different domain again but yes what they do is they would be having a certain uh, triggers so say every 15 20 seconds i have a system to identify faces or to identify obstacles on the road retrain myself because google does not know what new object is going to come and sit over there right so if it, if a car is not able to identify it what's going to happen is going to, it might crash or it might stop which might stop their business so I, again i'll say it's a very different level but yes this is what is currently going on in the market so uh, you would have heard about uh, coding bots have you guys heard about this i am currently working on one of them you just tell you just write the algorithm the bot will code for you so let us say you wrote something which bot is not able to get it what it will do it will take it up it will retrain itself and then it will give you a solution back to you you just have to scribble you know what is your algorithm mm -hmm. it will code it up for you ah krishna you mean like this python code also you mean that way yeah yeah any any okay. technology independent okay technology independent so uh, i was planning for an industry session on to this yet i am okay. yet to complete this to be very frank the basic working thing is with me but the only issue is the corpus that i have no because i need to have a corpus so let us say if i say hot encode my uh, variable so when i say this my bot will understand what is hot what is encode it will try to search in my corpus it will pick up one of my uh same thing and from there it will pick up code very easy okay okay what i need is i need this backend i need somebody to make this up. unless and until i go and edit it it's not going to work out currently i'm struggling with this 
Okay. Uh, and I heard one yeah, who uh, used this also, Krishna, like uh, some people are coming with this, uh, you need this automated testing, right? That mm. itself they are using artificial intelligence. You have got any idea on that? Yes, yes. I have deployed one of them. I'll show you. Yeah. Um, ha, okay. Like say I'm, I'm doing a, a website. I want to automate it using AI means what do you do actually? Yes. Let me show you because I hail from that background. Okay. So I transitioned as a full stack developer to data science. <laughs> so okay. I have developed a system here. I will give you what the system is. See what used to happen is um, there is a code. Let us say. So this is my release number one. All right. So that, let us say in, in this particular product, there are release one, release two and release one. Okay. Currently I'm on release one and depending on my features that I have released in this stuff, I have done some manual. So I have a manual tester and I have an automation tester, both of them. Yes. Work. Yes. So in manual, I will say I can have somebody on performance testing and on functional testing and I will say on security part of it. That's yes. Right. Yes. Yes. An automation guy, let us say we talk about Selenium and UFT, the most famous ones. So okay. What happens is, let us say it's a web. So Selenium is connected to that. And this, okay. depending on the web features, the, 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 the tester writes a script. And yes. they have a script ready, which could be run on to my release number one. So let okay. us say it takes around X days of time to do it. Okay. Now these guys come back with release number two. Now in this release number two, there are possibilities that the client would have changed certain requirements and these guys have changed certain <coughs> patches here and there. Yes. If I, if I want to rerun the script, it will not run. I have to make changes here. Correct. So again, it will take Y amount of days to do that. So Correct. what I have done is as soon as you, you bring in release two, I will compare release two with release one. Okay. I will try to find out places where there are changes done. Yeah. And you mean in the code, I, you mean in the code, you will find places where yes. there are changes. How, yes. how will you do that? How, you will have this coding. Okay. Yeah. We use uh, NLP for that. We use NLP. So in NLP, oh. we will try to summarize what exactly that code does. But to do oh. that, we need a very good corpus. So if I write a code for you, let us see if I write a for loop for you. Okay. I should have good amount of for loops with me so that my code understands that, okay, a for loop does this job. Right? Okay. Yeah. So it is a very difficult task to get that corpus. But once you have the corpus in hand, uh, it is very simple to do it. So now what I do is I try to find out the difference, first of all. Okay. If I say, let us say my threshold value, if, if, if the automation tester says that, if the changes is around 10% of the script, it's okay. I will do it. You don't have to do a costly affair like this for me. But okay. if I say my code has changed by 50%, for example, in okay. that case, what I will do is I'll pinpoint the changes and using a, what do you say, a traceability matrix, I will say if this is changed, a particular portion of my script also needs to be changed. So I will go and tell the pointers for the automation tester to go and change. That's it. Okay. Yes, re-script, I agree. But now he will know where to go in rescript. So this was the version number one that we deployed for uh, automation testing. But how you are connecting that code with the script, the testing script? So that uh, we have a tool. We have tools for that. So we call it. Uh, you, you got track and others. There's, no, there's a yeah. tool called track yeah. as well. And, and even uh, Jira allows you to do traceability. Jira does it. Yeah. Um, there is something <coughs> called uh, IBM rational, if I'm not wrong, that does it. IBM doors. Uh, yeah. There are so many tools which does require so, management, business analysis kind of thing. So you can intermediately use them to find a traceability matrix. That's it. So okay. and and uh, and also Ganesh, uh, just uh, digressing. But what uh, there are there are some uh, tools which are called TDD tools, right? Test driven development tools. You can yes. look for uh, tools like Optimal Trace, um, uh, Computer Associates, ARD, and Agile Requirement Designer is another tool. There are a few tools that is available. What you do there is you your BA kind of specs the whole requirements uh, like a business process diagram, and okay. uh, that kind of that kind of automates uh, tests. And when it, any change that happens in the code, you go back to the visual designer, change your requirements, and then it'll automatically uh, generate that. Look for these tools. It's not very cheap tools, but uh, but but they are uh, pretty popular.
Okay, okay, sure, sure. I, yeah. Uh, DDD tools, as they call. Yeah, but, but the okay. code uh, code generator, you know, I've Krishna, uh, uh, I've, hmm. I've I've seen quite a few startups uh, in code generator. There's one very popular startup in Canada that just started. Uh, Last year and gained a lot of traction. There's one in Bay Area as well. Um, uh, I'll try to look for them. But they've 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 been very uh, stub generation, scaffolding generation, right? They just couldn't go beyond that. Correct. That's what I felt, right? But and and of course today, Krishna, you, if you uh, are looking at it, I mean, we should also look at uh, the all the open sources in Git, which is publicly available, you know, and try to train models uh, based on all Git handles. Uh, most of the um, whatever cyber uh, uh, ethical hackers do that, right? They just yes. go look at all the code and find out <laughs> where there is a so, leak. So what I did was, unofficially what I did was, uh, whatever internal tools we have in my organization, you know, we collected all the codes with good comments, you know, with, with functional comments, I can say. That what does the below patch do, where it starts, where it ends. If you can get hold of very rich corpus like this, then designing this in NLP is not a big job at all. The only issue which I found was sometimes the code becomes very generic to be very frank. So if you have a very hi-fi customized codes that will not work here, the bot will, uh, will, will produce very generic stuff. But yes, down the line, uh, we are evolving. And also I'm expecting some of these larger companies like Google and Amazon to share some charity corpuses with us <laughs> so that we can go ahead with this, you know, on a public forum. Otherwise, what's going to happen? Every company will have this confidential stuff. You know, we, see, I cannot share it with you guys. Why? Because the codes are internal, to be very frank. So we will still wait, but this is going to be the next big thing where we will replace the coders itself. So I can fire up virtual machines, injectors, which will behave as my coding guys and let them develop it. <laughs> Yes, the only issue is where you need a little, little, little bit of customization. That's where human interf interference will come. Now, coming to this topic, what we did now, the next version, this was version number one. The next version, what we did was we collected all the changes that the automation person did, you know, as a corpus again. So we gave this back to our database. Okay. In the next model, what we did was even we were recommending that if this were the changes found, you can put this script. But that was possible only for one particular production environment. That means if you have got a project which has got similar releases, it is possible only to there because of the business logic problem. Yeah, okay. it's not generic. So let us say if we are talking about Mercedes Benz. So for all the topics or projects related to Mercedes Benz, this model could be trained and applied. But if you bring in some other account, it will not because the business logic over there is different. Because sometimes we have SAP and all flying around in the middle. You know, so when SAP comes in, you know, you guys, uh, if you guys have worked on it, there are a lot of business logic switching going here up and in those cases, these things will fail. But yes, in a similar environment, it can give a very good recommendation. So as far as I know, we have seen a good amount of, I showed a very good ROI onto this, especially on the billing of automation testers that we have got a very good uh, number. Yes, we need some manual switches here and there, but yes, it was predicting very good. Calls. It was a big time success. But now what is happening is this was an open, like this was developed from multiple tools. So tomorrow, if one of them collapses, the whole system will collapse. So the bigger companies like HP, Tricenters, uh, SAP, all these are coming up with their own uh, models. So like if you talk about SAP, there is something called Solution Manager, if you guys have worked upon. Now there are analytic options given inside Solution Manager. Workflow, Workbench, Dev, uh, what do you say, type uh, options are there. So you just script it, you will get the logic out of it, the whole, whole logic out of it. So these things are now replacing these kind of models. They are packaging it up, making it universal and selling it out. So soon even you might find there are packages inside UFT which do this, soon. There are some news on to that. I hope you people are aware about UFT, or at least from uh, Ganesh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, this maybe I need to also. Uh, I'm just finding where to start. Or maybe I will also start. With Do one thing. You connect with me offline. I'll I'll yeah. show you how to start this up. But I cannot yes, yes. show you something. But yes, 
I can give you some basic corpuses, or else yes. I can write, we can we can refer to some of the Git codes, download it, comment it, and use it as well. Yes, yes, yes. I can do that. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, so what I'm trying to say now is the, the thing that is going to happen after your, this module, that is your computer vision and NLP, that will be of different level basically. So these all are the applications or outcomes of these mod modules, to be very frank. Yeah. So again, I will say uh, ML was good, but uh, this is what is the next future. So some of you who are very senior over here, in your organizations, having an idea onto this, you can do a lot of proposals to your clients. You know, you can do a lot of cross selling basically. This brings us to the end of this tutorial on convolutional neural networks. Now, before you guys sign off, I'd like to inform you guys that we have launched a completely free platform called as Great Learning Academy, where you have access to free courses such as AI, cloud and digital marketing. You can check out the link in the description below. So guys, thank you very much for attending the session and have a great learning ahead.